Now let's talk about the IATF procedures, the way the sausage is actually made. The IATF works with people. This is different than most standards organizations, which work with members, with companies, or countries in many cases. We don't do that with the IATF. You're here as an individual, you participate as an individual, and it's your own opinion that makes a difference. If you stand up at the microphone and say, I'm from Cisco and Cisco thinks, people will laugh at you because everybody knows Cisco doesn't think. Companies don't think, the people in companies do. If you have an opinion, a technical opinion on something, then you get up the microphone and say, my opinion is X. Don't say you're from Cisco and believe that somehow the factor from Cisco is going to make any difference. It's not. It's going to be negative if anything. So we have any, don't have any representatives, corporate representatives or government representatives. It is people, individuals. Dave Clark in 1992, when the IETF reorganized, has put it famously, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. The kings comes from the fact that at the time in, before 1992, the membership of the IESG and other governing bodies was hereditary in the sense that the chair of that committee selected the members of the committee. That's no longer the case. It's all done with nominations committees. Don't believe in presidents, which would be a voting process uh, for selecting the leadership. We don't believe in voting for, the, for deciding what standards get adopted. Part of the reason we don't believe in voting is we don't have any constituency. We, you don't have to sign any agreement to participate in the IETF. You just show up on a mailing list or you show up at a meeting, paying the meeting fee, of course. But we don't have any kind of way to figure out who is part of the IETF. So we have to deal with a general consensus-based approach. We'll talk later about why it's rough consensus rather than consensus and what the running code comes from. Many times, in order to gauge the interest in a topic, a area director will charter a BOF, a birds of a feather session. It's not always preceding a working group. A BOF could simply be for general information, but more, almost often people who put together birds of a feather sessions are doing so because they want to form a working group. It's a group of people that are interested in a topic, puts this together. In order to get a BOF, you the ISG now requires you to have a description and an agenda for the BOF. If you're, this is a pre-working group BOF, you also generally have to have a proposed charter for the working group. But if it's just for information, then you don't need to have a proposed charter. The BOFs are only scheduled if an area director supports it, and generally these days if the ISG supports it. Uh, many area directors, when I was an area director, I required that you couldn't have a BOF until you'd have a document published, at least one internet draft published, and you'd have a, had a, have had a reasonable discussion on a mailing list. So you can gauge that there are people actually interested. Sometimes it's a little hard to gauge. I remember one time in, uh, in my tenure as an area director was a, a BOF, a very popular BOF, there were maybe 300 people in the room, at a time when the IETF wasn't that big. At the end of the BOF, I got up and as area director asked how many people in this room believe that the this should be an IETF working group. And about half the people in the room put up their hand. I didn't count them, I just saw it was about half. Then I asked the reverse question, how many people think it should not be an IETF working group? And about half the people in the room put up their hand which meant there was not a consensus that it should be a working group, and it was no working group was formed at that time. As area director, uh, I felt there was too much contention, and there wasn't a consensus that this was the right time to do this. Later, A few years later, that working group was formed, but that was after a great deal of focus and revisions of the proposed charter. Generally, BOFs meet just once. As I say, sometimes it can be a one-time thing. Mostly BOFs are there to convince an area director that there are a group of worker bees or a group of people who are actually interested in this topic. They have consensus on an approach. It's not research. If it's research, it should be done as a research group out over in the IRTF. But if it's ready for standardization, you've got a group of people interested in it, a group of people are actually going to work on it, then maybe it's okay to have a working group. 
creating a working group without a core group of people that are going to actually do the work doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, don't get anywhere. The working groups, uh, this is where the IETF work gets done. Almost all of IETF standards, but not all, come from working groups. Uh, they're, they're basically around a, ma a mailing list. Most of the work of a working group is done on a mailing list, not done in the face-to-face -face meetings. At an IETF meeting, there may be 50 or 60 or more working groups that meet over the, cor over the course of the week. Each working group meeting is very short, an hour to two and a half hours long. Not enough time to actually sit down and write standards in the working group meeting. The working group meeting is set aside for high-level issues, questions of, uh, that you need to resolve. The actual work of the working group is done uh, on the mailing list. The working group has a, has, has a charter. Uh, the working groups tend to be bottoms up. It's very rare for, the, for an area director or the IESG to uh, come up with a concept and implementation of a working group. Almost always it is bottoms up, but it's, pro it's proposed by interest people of, that are interested in the topic and proposed to an area, to a area director by those people. It's not created from on top. Occasionally, very occasionally, one in 50 working groups are the result of an area director deciding we needed to do some work in this space. But almost always it's bottoms up. This means, by the way, that the IETF management really doesn't have any way of guaranteeing the IETF will do something. When the IETF management is talking with a, another standards development organization or with a regulatory authority, you can't say, oh yeah, the IETF will develop that technology, because it depends on people being interested in the topic. Sometimes working groups are preceded by boss, but they're not always. The graphic here is just a a, a snapshot of some of the working groups in the, in, the, uh, in the first part of the listing that's on the website. Working groups have charters. The charters are agreed upon by between the working group chairs, area director, and the ISG. The ISG has final say. They're, the charters are restrictive. The charters say what the working group is to work on. And either by implication or by statement, it says what the working group should not work on. If it's not in the charter, the charter, uh, the working group's not supposed to work on that topic. If someone believes that the working group should be expanded to work on a new topic, that any kind of expansion has to be approved by the area director and by the IESG. The charter is approved by the IESG only after public announcement. An announcement is sent out to the IETF community, but it's also sent to other standards de development organizations in the general internet space. We set up a mailing list a number of years ago that any other standards organization that's in interested in internet standards can subscribe to. So the ISG sends out an announcement saying, we're thinking of creating a working group in this area, here's its charter, please let us know any comments. That goes to the IETF community, and the IETF community can respond, and it goes to the international standards development organization community, and they can, they can respond get responses back from other SDOs saying, oh yeah, we already have a working group in this area. Please liaison with us or please uh, check what we're doing or maybe a request to not for the IETF to not do a working group because somebody else is already working on it. The ISG takes all of those comments into consideration and then decides whether to form the working group or not and decides on the details in the charter. The charter can be updated to say, for example, that the working group has to interact with a working party or working group in some other standards organization, or the ISG could just say, well, this is something, it's an area that's already covered, so we don't need to cover it here. In theory, working groups are closed when their job's done, because the charter is run out. Some, some working groups, though, are very long-lived because there's more, still keeps getting more work to do. Their charters keep getting changed to do the more work, or the topic they're working on, like transporting different technology over the internet is an ongoing thing. Keep, technology keeps changing, so there's new technology you need to big, figure out how to transport over the net. But most working groups get closed when their work is done after two to five years or so. There is a possibility for individuals to do uh, their uh, standardization work, but mostly work is done in the, in the working groups. 
you are an individual, you can publish you can publish an internet draft, you revise the internet draft with discussion on a mailing list, and then when it, you're ready, you can propose it to be published. That's the same basic mechanism that the working groups use. Somebody pub publishes an internet draft, either in the name of the working group or in their own name. The working group then discusses the individual or in, individual uh, internet draft, produces revisions of it, can be many, many revisions. The I, I, IDR working group had 24 revisions of the, B, of the BGP document before they published it as an RFC. So it can be going back and forth many, many times. Every time it goes through revisions, a, they use the same file name, but a two-digit version number is appended to the file name, so you can tell what sca which stage something is at. When the working group thinks that the document, the internet draft, is ready for publication, it sends the, uh, the internet draft to, or sends a notice about the internet draft to their responsible area director. If there's an individual doing something, he, he finds, the individual finds an area director that, that the individual believes will be interested in the topic and tries to persuade the area director to look at the document and decide to, whether to support it. In either case, the area director does a technical review of the document, technical and cleanliness and process review, make sure it's written, it's written in English, make sure it's understandable, make sure that in the case of working group, the proper process was followed, that the right level of consensus was determined. All of those things, if the area director doesn't like something, thinks something should be improved, Area director can return the ID to the working group for more work or return the, the ID to the individual proposing it for more work. When the area, ID is, the area director is satisfied, the area director then passes a request on to the ISG for publication. The ISG then issues a IETF-wide last call. A well, last call is asking for anybody in the IETF community and these these last call requests also go to that interna international group, the mailing list which has the international group of standards development organizations on there, so asking for any kind of comments on the, on the proposal. This is a two-week period if it's a working group document and a four-week group period if it's an individual document. When the, that period's done, the ISG does its own inter interdisciplinary technical review each of the area directors reviews the document based on their own set of criteria. If the ISG doesn't like something it sees, it returns the ID to the working group or the individual with comments to say what they think is wrong. The individual or working group can then revise it, revise the document, go, th go through the working group or mailing list again, um, and come up with a version that and eventually the ISG approves, or ISG likes. Sometimes the ISG will just say, this is not a document we think should be published ever. Our comments say, go away. It's very rare because if it gets, if the document gets this far in the process, it's something that generally is gonna make it through. But it's, it's theoretically possible for the ISG just to decide that this is just not, a, not something the ISG should, the, should approve and the IETF should not publish. If the ISG approves, then it sends a note to the RFC editor saying to publish this, RFC, this internet draft as an RFC. I mentioned rough consensus. Dave Clark talked about rough consensus and running code. Consensus in the formal sense is where everybody is satisfied. Or as Margaret Thatcher is quoted as saying, where everybody's equally dissatisfied. Well, that's not the way we work it in the ITF. If in the regular standards process where consensus is required, you have somebody who is an outlier, who doesn't like something or who wants their own special feature put into the technology, then that special feature will be put in because you'll never get that person's support, their consensus, unless that feature is put in there. The IETF believes in rough consensus. If somebody wants something in, in a particular standard, but the vast majority of the working group says no, then the IETF can proceed. There does not have to be unanimity. There doesn't have to be absolute consensus. You don't have to have everybody satisfied in the result before it can be published. We can go rough consensus. 
can do a show of hands to figure out the level of cons um, consensus, uh, but it's not a vote. We don't have voting because we don't have the constituency, as I mentioned before. So this is a general trying to understand the view of the people in the room. So you can do a show of hands, but when you do a show of hands, you don't actually count the hands. You look and say, oh yeah, there's a lot of hands up for this and there's not so many hands against it, so that must mean we've got rough consensus. If it's 50-50, like that working group of the BOF that I mentioned, then you know you don't have consistent, you don't have consensus. It's not ready to go. We also do a hum. Uh, it's like a show of hands, except it's anonymous. With a show of hands, I can tell that Joe is voting for this, and I trust Joe, so I'll vote for this. Whereas with a hum, I don't know who's voting for or against something. I can only tell by the strength of the sound whether there's a general degree of support or a general degree not non-support, or it's relatively balanced. If the sound is approximately equal, then we don't have consensus. If it's much more sound in favor or against something, then we know we have a rough consensus. We don't want to get an absolute number. We don't want to say this standard gets approved because the 51 percent of the people agreed with it. Well, we don't have a way to know what, what the, the total number of people is, so we can't do that. So the show of hands is for a general feeling of what the level of support is and a hum to produces the same result. We try and resolve all disputes with discussion, discussion on mailing lists and where there's high, where there's cases where the high volume of face-to-face -face communication be useful, do that in the face-to-face -face IETF meetings. The, the conclusion can be pretty rough. There's times when it is 60% in favor and 40 against. Mostly though it's in the 90 to 95% in favor and the rest are opposed. But it does vary. It depends on what the issue is. If it's bit order on the wire and it doesn't actually make any technical difference, it's only aesthetics, then we can have something that's pretty rough. That's 60% in favor. But if it's something where it's a set of functionality and whether the functionality is there or not, uh, it can be very important, and in that case, you want much stronger consensus. So we get up in the 85 to 95 percent support before you can figure that it's ready to move. But because the IETF work is on mailing lists and the working group mailing lists, we don't reach final conclusions at the face-to-face -face meetings. Any temporary conclusion, any uh, preliminary conclusion of consensus which is obtained during the face-to-face -face meeting with a show of hands or a hum, must be verified on the mailing list. And that's not necessarily easy. Online discussion is very difficult, very difficult to judge consensus on, because some idiot with a fast, a fast typist and a strong opinion can dominate the discussion on a mailing list. And you don't really, can't really tell how many people are in favor or against something just by the volume of traffic. If, particularly if a lot of traffic is from one or two individuals. And we get a lot of vehement traffic, some people might drop off the mailing list. So it's a difficult thing. It is the responsibility of the working group chair to determine when there is consensus, rough consensus, on a mailing list. And that's why we pay them big bucks for being volunteers to, to do this.